Okay, we're live. All right, here we are on our live Q&A for Get Healthy UTV. I am so excited for any of you, uh, any of you who are joining us right away. Um, I'm ready to answer questions for an hour. Um, if you notice me sweating, it's because I have no air conditioning in my house. It's broken, and we it's about 85 outside in Minneapolis today. It's about 95 inside my house. So um, that's the scoop. I got some nice cold weather and I have water, and I have a fabulous moderator with me today, one of the lovely ladies who works at Get Healthy You, Miss Kate Lang. How are you? Hey there, Good. Kate. Hi, everybody. Um, good. I hope you guys, could you all hear me okay? Kate, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, good, because I saw a little mute sign, and I thought, uh-oh, did I do something wrong? Um, okay, so Kate um, is here with us. She's going to moderate all the questions. I'm going to do my best to answer as many as I can in an hour. Um, so I hope you can join us for the whole hour. If not, join us for as much time as you can. I just want to remind everybody that these are all rewatchable. So if you go to GetHealthyUTV.com and click on Live Events, you can rewatch the past Q&As. And we do this once a month at 7 p.m., typically towards the end of the month. So that's a scoop, Kate. Let's get right into it and see. We had a lot of pre-asked questions, so let's Great. get started. Yeah, we sure do. Clemente wants to know what the most effective exercise is for the inner thigh area. Okay, so for the, well, the inner thigh, the adductors. Whoops, my screen keeps going goofy. Um, so your adductors, well, I will always tell you the squats and lunges work the inner thigh. Um, and a lot of times people like to isolate just the inner thighs because they like to feel that muscle working. Um, remember the thigh master back in the Suzanne Summers days? Um, but the reality is squats and lunges engage the adductor. So, uh, you know, Get Healthy UTV, we got lots of workouts that use squats and lunges. We also have that new bar sculpt uh, workout by the lovely Lindsay Baumgren, and she is one of our new instructors. She's the cutest stinking thing ever. I'm going to get her on one of these live events with me. Um, but she does a lot of leg lifts and a lot of movements that are uh, quick pulsing movements, and that will really get the adductors also. Um, so it's kind of a total body thing. You can isolate the adductors by moving the knees you know, in and out, but I would suggest lots of squats and lunges. Sounds good. All right, Annie's asking you some career advice. She's looking to change industries and wondering how to become a fitness professional and follow her passion. Well, Annie, that depends on whether you have any background in fitness. I assume if that's your passion, you must be an avid worker-outer, if that's even a word in the English language. Um, or you've probably experimented with some personal training, maybe personal train some friends and are looking to get certified. That would be the first thing I would do. Was I would before you would even change careers, I would look into getting certified. <laughs> Go through some of those courses, make sure it's something that you love. Um, the American Council on Exercise has an amazing personal trainer and group fitness certification program. It's changed so much in the years. Um, it's unbelievable. It's now all interactive. You can do classes online. You can interact with groups online and talk. I think you would learn a lot about the business side of it by taking those courses, and that might give you a good idea of, like, do I really want to pursue this? Um, because you kind of have to get in um, to some sort of a gym atmosphere or something to begin and then build your clientele. But check out the American Council on Exercise, acefitness.com, or just Google them. I think that would be a good way to do it. Those are good ideas. Deb's asking, can you give us some suggestions on exercises to fight postmenopausal, age 57 and plus, belly fat? Hello, postmenopausal. Um, I am giggling because I went, so I told um, one of my lunch and learns, by the way, you guys, I come live for about 15, 20 minutes every Monday at noon central over on Facebook. And I told one of my lunch and learns that I would go to the doctor and get my hormones tested because I'm pretty sure that I personally am through menopause myself. I'm 50, but it seems kind of early. At least I thought it was early. But um, I went to the doctor and she said, oh, yeah, honey, you're done. You're, you're through it. Um, and my, my uh, hormone levels, my estrogen is low, which is a good thing. I mean, we all want estrogen because it makes us feel more vital. But estrogen dominance is really a big problem for belly fat. So... That being said, if you are feeling like you're menopausal weight gain and belly fat, a couple of things come into play. And by the way, go to GetHealthyU.com. That's the free side of the website. GetHealthyU.com is free. Get Healthy U TV is where all of the videos are housed for your membership. But we have a great blog called The Four Horm Hormones that uh, you, know, you need to watch as you get in, uh, past menopause to reduce belly fat. So estrogen is one of them. Estrogen dominance can cause belly fat. And you might want to get that tested 
typically postmenopausal, you're low in estrogen. But I don't know if you're taking a, a replacement hormone. I am not. Um, but you don't want too much estrogen in the bloodstream. Um, second thing I'm, I'm thinking uh, is, um, first of all, cortisol. So the stress hormone. And we, you know, we think as we get later in life that we have less stress. That's not always necessarily true. And um, if you have a lot of cortisol in your system, it is. Think of that as the fat storing hormone. So you want to reduce stress. You want to reduce cortisol. Um, you want to reduce insulin uh, problems too, like too much. Your blood sugar being too high, and your blood sugar can get high from constantly snacking on white processed flour snacks, even though they're low in calories. Um, anything that has a lot of added sugars, fake sugars, fake sugars can even be a problem too. So if your insulin is high, that's also a fat storing hormone. Or if you just constantly give your body sugar rushes. So estrogen, insulin, and cortisol. You want to reduce those three hormones because hormones do have a lot to do with it. Then the other thing is as we age, you know, we tend to become a little bit more sedentary in our menopausal years. Um, even though we're getting that workout in one hour a day, we're still like here I am sitting in a chair. I'm not chasing kids. I'm not as active perhaps as I was when I was younger. So we really got to get in those steps. We got to move our bodies a little bit more. Drink a ton of water. Flush your body with water. And here's the other big bit of advice that Dr. Sarah, Sarah Gottfried, she's a um, hormone doctor. She always says eat a pound of vegetables a day. I'm not kidding. A pound of vegetables a day. All the fiber in the vegetables. Um, helps to reduce some of these fat storing hormones. So, and all the other uh, vitamins. So, that's my best advice. I'm going through it right now with you too. So, cheers. I just learned a lot. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, <laughs> Debbie had written in and asked us, how do you mentally stay in the game of eating right and exercising when you have a lot of weight to lose? She's trying to lose 60 plus pounds. Any tips to keep her motivated? Yeah, you know, that is hard. I mean, 60 pounds is hard. I, I, I'm, I sympathize with you. But at the same time, you know what? You're not too late. It's not too late to do this, but it is going to take time. And as much as I like the show The Biggest Loser, there are things I don't like about it. And one of the things I don't like about it is it makes you feel like this weight loss happened really quick. It did not. First of all, if you really watch that show, it happens over the course of a lot, a lot of months. They go home, they come back. Second of all, they're exercising for a crazy amount of time. They're exercising for eight freaking hours like a day, and then they're cutting their calories so low. They're trying to win money. If you saw the recent article in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal that was talking about all of those biggest loser contestants who are gaining the weight back and they've screwed up their metabolism, so now their metabolism is slower, um, that's just not the way to lose weight. So I, I hate to be like, I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but it's going to take time, and it's going to take a lot of motivation. And, you know, when you say it's hard to stay in the game, I totally agree with you. What you got to do is you've got to pick yourself back up off the floor the days that, you you know, you have a miss. Who cares if you have a miss? Everybody has a miss. If you aren't failing, you aren't learning. That's what they always say. There's no such thing, actually, as a failure. It's a learning experience. So you have a bad day, pick yourself back up. Go with baby steps. And here's what I like to tell people who are trying to lose a large amount of weight. Have small, little goals. So it's like a couple pounds a week, and you're kind of charting that. And then have the big goal looming at the end. Because if you're always thinking about those 60 pounds, it, it gets really hard. Um, and all of the clients that I've seen that have lost 60 to 100 pounds have said the beginning was the hardest. Then the weight started falling off, and it was like, oh, wow, this is working. And then they had that little plateau at the end where it was like, gosh, what am I going to do to get the rest off? That's where you have to change. So remember that whole saying that says um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. If you aren't getting results, something's got to change. The exercise, the food, uh, et cetera. So hang in there. I believe in you. That You have to believe in yourself, too. And um, you're never too late. You're never too late. So yes, you can. Great. We've got tons of questions coming in live right now. This is awesome. Sam's okay. asking, do you drink tea? And if so, what kind? <laughs> and can you give us any recommendations? Yes, I drink a lot of tea. I'm laughing because I'm sweating my butt off right now. If any of you are just joining us, my air conditioning is broken. Um, it's 85 in Minnesota right now, in Minneapolis, and my house, I swear, I'm not lying when I say it's 90 or 95. I have the windows open. I'm just dripping in sweat. Um, so now I've forgotten the question, Kate. <laughs> oh, what kind of tea, tea um, do you I drink, drink? I drink tea, but I don't drink hot. I, usually I drink hot tea every night. Um, I love hot tea. It's just soothing to me, but there's no chance I'm drinking hot tea tonight. I love cold green tea, too. I drink a lot of green tea. I drink a lot of chai tea. I love the spices in chai tea. That's my that's my gig. I mean, I love like that whole 
fall, uh, like cinnamon, cardamom. Um, I love pumpkin. I love all those flavors. So chai tea is a, an iced or ha hot, and then green tea, iced or hot. There are a lot of good properties in green tea. Antioxidants, it's good for um, reducing belly fat. It's good for lots of different things. So I highly recommend it. If you're going to sweeten your tea, I sometimes use stevia, or I'll just put a little um, honey or agave in there. Or, you know, God forbid, just a regular sugar packet. But, you know, just one, so it's okay. Okay, great. Um, Suzanne had written in, and she has some great questions about muscle soreness. She's starting to exercise, and she's getting really sore in her glutes and legs. She's wondering, um, aside from using a foam roller, is ice or is heat better? Okay, that's a good question. Um, every single one of these questions, you guys, by the way, I, I, I just sound like a broken record, but we have a blog about every single one of these questions on gethealthyyou.com. So go to Get Healthy, you search it in the search bar, what you're looking for. We have a blog that we just recently published about hot and cold therapy. So that's a really good question. When you are newly sore, um, or like I fell the other day, <laughs> it was horrible, in my Saturday morning class, because it was so hot and steamy, my, my toe slipped out from underneath me, and I shin digged right into the side of the stage, and it like blew up like an egg. So what did I do right after that? Ice. Ice is for new injuries, new inflammation, reducing soreness or, um, that's very acute, like something that's new. Heat is for chronic pain. So anything that they usually say about six weeks or over. But if you've had chronic pain, your back has been hurting you for six weeks, then three months, then six months. Heat will improve the circulation in that area and help to heal in that sense. So cold for a, a new injury. Um, or to reduce, you know, muscle soreness directly after a workout, heat for chronic um, injuries over six weeks. I heat my back up every morning. I sound like a broken record, any of you who have heard me say this, but I have a bad back. It took me a while to kind of figure out, okay, what was going on? And for me, a heating pad every morning, 10 minutes, without fail, if you saw me uh, in the airport and opened up my suitcase, there's a heating pad in there, never without it. Heat up for 10 minutes foam roll or use the massage ball on my um, low back, boom. And the key word here with any kind of um, treatment like that is consistency. You can't just foam roll once a month or heat your back, you know, heat up something and roll it out once a month. You've got to do it consistently. Once I started doing that every day, seven days a week, my back pain virtually 80% less. So. Great. Um, Lori's asking another great question, and I know where that information is going to be located, but other people won't. So Lori is wondering, she just started GHU TV, and her knees are hurting from some of the lunges and squats. Do we have any other ideas for her to yeah. have pain free knee workouts? Yes, we do. Okay, lunges and squats are amazing, but if you're just starting with them, it can um, cause some knee pain. If you've got a lot of weight to lose, that's a lot of stress to the knee joints, so you definitely want to go slow. I don't want you to injure those joints. Because I want you to think about some joints. Most of the joints in our body are hinges, like knees are a hinge, and then hips and shoulders are ball and socket. We have to be really careful with them and ease them into the workload. So in the case that you're doing um, a workout on Get Healthy UTV and you say, you know what, this is too much, I can't keep doing the lunges, get down on the ground and do a glute bridge. So you lay on the ground, feet are either on a ball or on the ground, and you lift your butt up off the ground. Now you are not putting impact on those kneecaps, but you get the opportunity to squeeze your glutes. You could also do leg presses with um, a resistance band. Um, and so anytime you're doing a, a Get Healthy you TV workout, get creative and, and, uh, and improvise. But to Kate's point on Get Healthy You, we have a couple of blogs that are all about exercise with bad knees. So how to do a lower body workout without putting impact on your knees, um, a HIIT workout for bad knees, how to avoid knee pain. We have a ton of stuff about knee pain at Get Healthy Use. So check out, we have some pictures of all the exercises. Um, and so I want you to check that out. Plus, um, Get Healthy U TV, have you checked out the walk and tongue workout? Because that one is a little bit easier on the knees too. And I really like that one. So. Great. Um, we've got a great question from Lynn. She's wondering what to know, what protein powder to buy. Soy, whey, and which one is best for weight loss? I wish I could like have a computer next to me and just keep flashing these articles up for you guys um, because we have an article all about like what does soy protein do in your body, what do plant-based proteins like hemp um, and pea protein or rice protein, what about whey protein. Um, so again, you can do the research using the search bar and get healthy you, but I'm going to tell you whey protein, if you're not a vegetarian, um, whey protein is by far the most readily used by your muscles. 
That's why it's so popular for people who work out. So whey protein, of course, is an animal byproduct because it's a dairy product. So, um, but it's easily absorbed and readily used by your muscles. I like Bipro. Now, if you go to the website, it's called BiproUSA.com. Um, I, what I love about Bipro is they do have an unflavored. They have vanilla and chocolate, but they have one that's called unflavored, and there's nothing in it. There's no additives, no sugars, no chemicals. It's just flat-out whey protein. So if you put it in water, it doesn't taste good. Um, but when you mix it in a mixer, or in a blender with fruit and almond milk and you know all different kinds of things, it's really fabulous. That's what I use. But that being said, um, I'm a big fan of animal. Uh, I'm sorry, plant-based protein. I like the Vega One. I'm not sure if it's Vega or Vega One um, protein powder. If you go like to Whole Foods, there's a couple of different brands of pea, rice, and hemp. Hemp is a little funky. You might not like hemp, but pea and rice are good. Um, and then. Um, to that point, soy, I'm not a fan of soy. I, I think we need to be careful with soy. If it's GMO soy, and I know there's stuff all over the news, but I'm not a fan of genetically modified soy, and especially for us ladies and our estrogen. Um, you, you know, the new, me, years ago it was like, eat soy, eat soy, eat soy. And then it was like, oh my God, don't eat soy, it's going to cause breast cancer. Now the pendulum is kind of flipped to the middle, and people say, soy is not horrible for you, it is a good protein product, but don't overdo it and try to avoid the GMO soy. So that is my uh, protein powder speech. Awesome. Carrie's wondering how often she should change up her workout routine. That's a really good question. Um, plateaus are about as uh, you know welcoming as rainy days. Um, you hit a plateau and you go, what is going on with my body? So think about it. It can often be because you keep doing the same workout over and over. Muscle does have memory. So if you keep doing the same thing over and over, it gets easier and easier for your body, and your body goes, hey, I, I know how to do this. I'm going to use less energy to do this exercise, therefore, you know, hitting a plateau. So um, typically, it depends on what kind of workouts you're doing. People will say cycle every month to six weeks. I personally cycle my workouts every day. Because I'm a group fitness you know, freak, um, I teach different classes Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And so they're all a little different. I'll do a hit class. I'll do a circuit class. I'll do a spin class, a yoga class, a kickboxing class. So I'm constantly using my muscles in different directions with different amount of weights as well as using my body weight. And then that just is constantly giving me variety. Um, so variety is, you know, super important. If you are a Get Healthy you TV member, go to the calendar area. We have spent a lot of time making those calendars for you guys because being a personal trainer, I know that people like a schedule. So what we've done is we've made a calendar for each program. So if you want to do definitions, there's a 28-day calendar. Or there, if you're going to do Rock Your Body Boot Camp, there's a 28-day calendar. But then we've also made what we call combination calendars, where just for those of you who say, you know, I need some variety, we combine different programs. So Firm and Burn, for instance, that calendar combines Rock Your Body Boot Camp, um, Power 20, and definitions. Uh, if you look at the Total Body Transformation, that one is hit... Um, power 20 and definition. So there's a bunch of combined cal calendars. And we do have a beginner's calendar that's a combo of like three different programs to give you variety. So hopefully that helps. Great. We have a really interesting one here from Sherry that I want to ask. Um, do you have any recommendations on the best ways to shed water weight? Drink water. Drink water. Exercise. The best detox program you can ever be on is sweat. Um, save your money and skip all these detox potions and <laughs> crazy things that people are doing. Stop starving yourself because that screws up your metabolism and sweat, sweat, sweat. Um, so actually drinking water and then sweating will help to reduce water weight. Um, also laying off the salt, but it depends on what kind of food you're Processed food is filled with salt, but if you're eating real fresh food, you know, salt should not be your problem. Chemicals. Chemicals and preservatives cause inflammation in the body and can and ha can cause you to uh, hold water weight. So stay away from some of that stuff too, especially as we age. Our bodies become so much more sensitive to that stuff. So that's my advice for water weight. But uh, drinking more water and sweating is really the key. Good. Take a drink. You look you look thirsty. Okay, Leslie's asking um, about uh, IT band issue she's got. So she's been taking cycling and she loves it but she's having a lot of pain in her IT band. Any suggestions to prevent future pain or maybe stretches? Mm, yeah, you got to stretch them out. Okay, for those of you who don't know what an IT band is, I'm going to stand up. So your IT band is right here, like from your hip straight down to your knee. All the way, It goes all the way down, actually. And it gets really tight. 
from a lot of movement that bends your knees. So cycling, running, biking, lunging, squatting, pretty much everything tightens up that IT band, but especially running, walking, and um, cycling. So foam roll, foam roll, foam roll. Foam roller, you guys, if you don't have a foam roller, I'm suggesting that you inv invest in one. It is the greatest tool ever because, it is, because what it does, it's myofascial release. So your fascia is underneath your skin, and think of it like webbing, all right? And so when you are um, get tight, that webbing starts to kind of like harden and get tight and get stuck together, and it reduces your range of motion and creates um, pain. So if you can release that uh, muscle, and wouldn't it all be nice if we had a personal masseuse that came to our house every day for an hour? Well, reality is I, I don't think anybody has that. Well, maybe Kim Kardashian, <laughs> who cares about her? <laughs> um, so... You know, when you roll over that IT band, and it can be very painful, but roll back and forth carefully about 10 times, so that's going to soften up the fascia. Then pin and hold the really tender part. So if you find that knot in there, hold it there and just breathe through it. It's kind of like that idea of someone putting their elbow or their thumb into that area. And then you can even cross friction fiber it. Um, that would be my that would be my number one choice for IT bands. Roll, roll, roll. Then you can do some other like side stretch exercises where you stand up and you reach over and you push your heel down to the ground so you feel it coming down through the IT band. Um, and like uh, doing some sort of like a runner's lunge will help. But really the foam rolling is a, a big key for IT band. Great. I've got another stretching question for you um, coming from Michelle. She sits at a desk all day long and she said she's super tight in front of her shoulders from sitting at a computer all day. Any quick stretches you could recommend for that? Yes, but I have to show you guys my puppy. She just walked over here. This is Roxy. Look at Roxy. She's um, just nine weeks old. She's being such a good puppy while we're on air. I was so worried she would be a whiny, but she's being a really good puppy. Look into the camera, Roxy. <laughs> she sees a fly on the wall. Oh, my gosh. Okay. There you go, girly. Um, okay. Stretching the shoulders. So the shoulders are tight from sitting all day. And you know what? Also from just having your hands on a computer and doing this. So if you look right here, a lot of times I even find myself during the day doing this, engaging my traps right here. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, just release those shoulders um, while you're typing. So first of all, shoulder rolls throughout the day. Just roll those shoulders. Second of all, take your hands behind you onto that chair and just open up through your front body. That feels really nice. Um, you can even do these where you slide your shoulder blades down your back, up and down. Um, a nice shoulder stretch across the body right here. Oh, this feels really good right now. I need this. Um, so you pull each shoulder across and hold. When you um, stretch, by the way, everybody, when you stretch, hold your stretches for approximately 20 to 40 seconds. That's kind of what you want to do um, to get to get the you know to get the benefit. I find that I see people and my myself. I mean, I'm guilty of this too. Doing this, you know, mm, stretch. Okay, I just stretch my shoulders, and that pretty much does nothing. So make sure you're holding the stretches long enough. Um, but throughout the day, just get those shoulder rolls going and try to depress your shoulders away from your ears. Oh, another favorite is a yoga pose where you push your hand down and then you take your ear to shoulder and you feel that stretch through your neck right there. So that's another good one. Awesome. Um, we've got another question coming in from Kara. She's asking about approaching the age of 40 and her metabolism basically she do to rev up that metabolism um, so you cut out a little bit say that again she just turned 40 okay, sure sure Kara just turned 40 okay and her metabolism has pretty much stopped oh, okay. what can you do to rev that up <laughs> well now how do you know your metabolism is stopped um, but you know sometimes people do feel that especially milestone birthdays it's kind of a mental thing too but it does happen because as we age, if you are not actively replacing the muscle on your body, so here's, let me go back. After the age of about 35 or 40, um, if you are not actively replaced, uh, working your muscles, you lose about a pound, half a pound to a pound of muscle a year. The key is if you are not actively replacing it. So if you are doing no muscle work, you're slowly but surely deteriorating your muscle and then your metabolism goes down because muscle eats more calories per day at a resting heart rate than body fat. Muscle is a more metabolic tissue in your body and it needs more calories um, to stay alive basically. So if you are losing muscle, one of the best things you can do as we're aging is start strength training. And like I said, you're never too late. So if you're 40 and you're going, wow, my metabolism's going down, pick up those weights, 
Join Get Healthy UTV, work out, and get those muscles moving at least three days a week. And I'm pretty sure you would see a difference even in, you know, two to four weeks, no question. Great. Susan's asking, um, be consuming a day. She's quite active. She's walking four to five days a week and doing GHU TV workouts. So how does she know how many calories she should be consuming a day? Well, I mean, everybody's different. Your um, own internal genetic metabolism um, is something that's hard to know without getting it tested. Um, but you can kind of guess, you know, all these little devices, your Fitbit, your Apple Watch, your uh, whatever you might have, an up band, or some of the different devices, do a fairly good job of, of est estimating your daily activities and your metabolic um, activities. They kind of have an algorithm for that. So I can't really tell you because it's based on your weight and how tall you are and your genetics. But for most women, I can safely say somewhere, if you're trying to lose weight, somewhere between 1,600, 1,800 calories, I really feel like 1,200 calorie diets are really too low if you are active you know, all the time because I exercise a lot. If I only ate 1,200 calories, I'd be so flipping hungry, I wouldn't be able to stand it. Um, and what I tell people a lot of the time too is it's not just how many calories, it's the type of calories. If you eat 16, 1800, even 2000, I mean, I'm sure I eat 2000 calories a day of junk, all the chemicals and the way it reacts in your body is quite different than if you're eating healthy fats, of avocados, nuts, seeds, um, coconut oil, if you're eating healthy proteins, if you're eating tons of veggies, um, those kinds of things are going to react differently in your body. So the type of cal uh, calorie matters as much as the amount of calories. But that being said, um, Usually for women trying to lose weight, 16 to 1800 calories is going to do it with good exercise. Um, 1600 would probably be a fair number if you want to be aggressive about um, losing weight. But uh, strength training too. While you're doing that strength training, it should start to kind of reverse that metabolism. And so hopefully that helps. But keep a diary of not only the type of the amount of calories, but the type of calories, because that sometimes is really eye-opening to go gee, my choices aren't as great as I thought they were. Because if you can get chemicals out of your life, I have a feeling, no matter what, you're going to lose some weight. I'm looking for my right. puppy. She's walking around. <laughs> She's so cute. Samantha's wondering about weight loss drinks. Um, she's recently started selling and taking weight loss drinks and says she's lost four pounds this week. What are your thoughts on weight loss drinks in general? Well... I'm not a fan, but that doesn't mean they don't work or there aren't good ones out there. I'm not a fan for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm too hungry to drink all my calories. Um, I like to eat. I like to chew, and I think that that's a pretty human instinctive thing that we like to chew, so um, it would be hard for me to drink all my calories. Second of all, they're usually, and I don't know which one you're taking, but they're usually filled with chemicals, food coloring, um, hidden weird stuff that causes bloating, that causes stomach issues, so I'm not a fan of that, and um, I'm a, just a, I'd rather eat real food, quite frankly. But the other reason I'm not a huge fan is they're typically in some sort of a multi-level marketing scheme, and um, I, if I could just tell you, and Kate, you know, because Kate helps monitor the website, we get emails literally daily from people who want me to sell their product for them because they care more about selling the product than they do about how quality the product is. And so that kind of marketing just is, I'm not, you know, I'm not a huge fan of that. That's kind of my problem. Um, so that being said, you know, losing four pounds in the first week, if you have just been drinking a lot of water and exercising, it might not just be the weight loss drink. It could just be that you, you're kind of ridding your body of some toxins and reducing some inflammation. So, you know, keep going, see what you think. But um, my best advice, go look at that ingredient label really carefully and look up all of the ingredients and make sure they're, they're what you want in your body. That's great advice. Lil's asking about workouts, and will you lose more weight if you work out at night versus morning? Does it matter when you work out if you're trying to lose weight? That's a great question. Um, this is what I always tell people. A calorie burned at 6 a.m. is the same calorie burned at 6 p.m. Okay, calories count. It doesn't matter when you burn it. As a matter of fact, you burn a lot of calories sleeping. So sleep, sleep, sleep. I'm, <laughs> once I figured out how many calories I was burning sleeping by using a Fitbit, I was like, are you kidding me? I'm going to start sleeping like two extra hours a night. It's worth it. Um, but that being said, um, okay, wait, repeat the question. I want to make sure I answer it. If you work out in the morning, will you lose yeah. as much weight as 
I wanted to I wanted to hit that. Thanks, Kate. Um, I wanted to make sure it was about weight loss. Um, so you know, calorie burned is a calorie burned. But here's why I like morning exercise, and you work out at night. Why I correlate it to weight loss, because for a lot of people, later turns into never. So I work with a lot of people who tell me, okay, I'm gonna as soon as the kids go down for a nap, I'm gonna do this, or as soon as my husband gets home, I'm gonna go work out. But then what happens is life gets busy, you get a phone call, you have an accident in the house, whatever happens, and then pretty soon I'll talk to people and go, oh my gosh, I haven't worked out in five days. So the thing I like about morning exercise is the early bird catches the worm. A lot of people tend to be, and this is not for sure, but they tend to be more consistent because there's not as many distractions in the morning. That's why I love morning exercise. But quite frankly, whatever fits in your life. I, I work with some, you know, and many of you in my community will tell me, listen, I go to work at like 5 in the morning, so there's no way I'm working out at 3. Okay, I totally agree with you. That would be ridiculous. So then see what you can do to fit movement in at different times or later in the day because it honestly doesn't matter. Great. Um, Kelsey has some great questions. She's working out seven days a week and eating really healthy, but she seems to have a big issue with sugar. What are some tricks to help her kick the sugar addiction she has? I hear you. And you know what? At night um, tends to be the hardest time for most people. And you know why? Because that's kind of when we let our guard down at night. Like after a long day of constantly beating battles all day long, whether it's been at work or fighting traffic or dealing with your kids or whatever it might be, your coworkers, you get home and you kind of like take a deep sigh and you let your barriers down and you're a tad more vulnerable and that's when people have a lot of eating issues because it kind of becomes mindless and it becomes soothing and sugar is soothing. Sugar is addicting and I am a huge sugar lover, believe me. If sugar was not addicting and it didn't cause weight gain, I'd be bathing in sugar. I love it. Um, so you really have to, to take a hard look at what you could use to replace it. Now, um, I know this doesn't sound as exciting, but fruit, especially as we're entering the summer season, is like simply amazing. Pineapple is like candy to me. I take uh, bananas, I freeze them into like, I slice them and freeze them into little banana coins, um, dip them in a little dark chocolate or eat a little piece of dark chocolate with them because dark chocolate, if it's at least 70% cacao, um, is a healthy fat actually and has magnesium in it, so it's really good for you. So, you know, maybe that would be a good, uh, I, I keep looking at my puppy because she's, she's getting in a little trouble. I'm going to have to pull her down there in a minute. Um, but uh, I tend to like, I like Greek yogurt. I eat, I eat dairy, so I'll take a Greek yogurt. I'll just drizzle some honey or agave in it and mix it up. So it's kind of, I love how thick it is. And then I'll put some almonds and dark chocolate chips in there or some blueberries. And that's kind of my nighttime snack. So come up with some things that you could do uh, that you could use as substitutes but still have kind of a creamy and sugary uh, flavor to them. And maybe that would work for you. Or maybe a smoothie. Smoothies aren't just for morning. Have a fruit smoothie um, in the evening. If that could occur, you know, with some almond milk and some frozen fruit, that might do the trick for you, too. By the way, I want to make a comment about natural sugar. Um, people will say to me, oh, my gosh, Chris, you eat fruit? Why would you eat fruit? Why would I eat fruit? Because it's delicious. It grows, <laughs> you know, from the, it's real food. Um, fruit, natural sugar is different because it comes loaded with fiber alongside of it as well as vitamins. And when you combine natural sugar with fiber, it reacts very different in your body than just sugar without fiber. So keep that in mind. Awesome. Um, this is a great question from Laura. Do I yep. have to sweat to call a workout a workout? Say that again, Kate. I'm sorry. Laura asked if she has to sweat to call a workout a workout. Does she have to get really sweaty when she's working out to have it count? Well, no, because not everybody um, sweats at the same rate. And also, you know, I think, uh, for instance, in Minnesota, in the winter, I don't sweat quite as hard as I do like at this time of year. Today, the gym was so sweaty, I didn't even have to move and I was dripping in sweat. So sometimes sweat gives you a false sense of like a very hard workout. Um, because really what sweat is, is that core body temperature is heating up and then as it heats up, you sweat and the water dissipates. And in the winter, it will evaporate a little faster because there's not so you know, such a high dew point or humidity in the air, whereas in the summer it just kind of sits on your skin and you feel like you're sweating more than you were earlier. Okay, so that's a little bit about sweat. But um, here's what I would ask you, because everyone sweats at a different rate, is how hard are you working? That's what matters more. You want to get to that intensity level where you're breathing through your mouth and you feel, I like to use the words, comfortably hard, where you're pushing yourself um, and it's a little uncomfortable, but you're willing to handle it. So I call it comfortably hard. Then, you know, that, that's what I would be more concerned about was your intensity rather than the amount of sweat on your skin. Um, 
when I'm in Arizona visiting my family um, and I'm out running, I don't get very sweaty because it's so dry in the desert. So, you know, sometimes sweat isn't the best gauge. Go with intensity. How hard are you working? Breathing through your mouth and feeling like you're pushing yourself to a point where it's, a, you know, you're, you're challenging yourself, but you're not overdoing it to the point where, you know, you feel sick. Great. Patty's asking about the scales that measure BMI and body fat percentage. What are your thoughts on those scales and how accurate are they? I'm not a huge fan and I'll tell you why because so many of us hang our hat on that scale, right? You get up in the morning, you weigh yourself and if you weigh two pounds more, your whole day is ruined. Um, and quite frankly, and again this is just my personal opinion, but I don't think they're very accurate. How can they measure the water in your body? Um, and, and your you know your BMI and plus BMI is really old school. Don't go with BMI. Um, BMI was based way back in the day when um, bodies were different and, and we didn't have as much science backing. So I would rather know how much body fat I have on my body compared. I'm sorry, muscle mass compared to body fat versus my BMI number, which is your body mass index. And the mathematics behind the body mass index are kind of skewed. So throw that out the window, okay? Then when it comes to these scales where I'm measuring your hydration or your body fat, the technology is minimal in those. If you really want to know your body fat percentage, even um, the pinching that lots of trainers, including myself, used to use, people aren't using it anymore because it, it just isn't accurate enough. So they're doing uh, uh, biometrical impedance, but they're doing it through. There's a new machine. I, I can't think of what the name of it is. Some clubs are buying it. It's very expensive. Um, and that is... Uh, it's something that you stand on and it's very accurate. Also the bod pod. If you've ever heard of the bod pod, it looks like an egg. You physically get into it. Uh, we have one down at our, the Abbott Northwestern Hospital in um, Minnesota. I have been in a bod pod two times or three times uh, and it's very accurate for measuring your body fat. So that's a good way to know. But um, don't, you know, if you're going to use one of those scales, just give yourself some leeway of a couple percentage points because they actually can vary that much. Great. Jeanette's asking about HIIT workouts. She's in a plateau, and she's really trying to get rid of these last 15 pounds, but how many times a week should she be doing HIIT? You know, you can't really do HIIT every day at the highest intensity. A lot of times what happens is if you're doing it every day, instead of it becoming a high-intensity interval program, it just becomes an interval program. Uh, you're not able to push yourself at that level. I would say two to three times a week is plenty for HIIT. Um, but a lot of times people will do them daily and then they won't, they're, they're, like I just said, their intensity will be a little bit different. Um, what I love about HIIT workouts is you push, you rest, you push, you rest, and that heart rate, so your lung capacity is getting pushed bigger and bigger and slowly but surely you can, you have a better VO2 max, you have a better capacity to take in the oxygen and, um, and use it and you feel more comfortable in exercise. Uh, so, and plus you get a good afterburn from HIIT. So I love HIIT, but it's intense. Try two to three times a week. Intercede it with like some circuits and some other different things as well. Variety is really helpful when it comes to weight loss. Really, uh, you know, add some variety. Do some heavy weight days and some lighter weight days. That's what I would suggest. Great. Lissa's asking about kind of finding a balance between sleep and working out. She's trying to work out every morning at 5.30 in the morning, but she can't sleep at night. She's currently taking Lunesta. Do you have any ideas for her on how she can get a really good night's sleep and how many hours of sleep she needs to make her weight loss plan successful? Well, okay, sleep is an interesting thing because sleep is so important. It is the third component. when it Well, it's actually the fourth component when it comes to your health. So we've got food, we've got movement, we've got mind, how we think, the type of the way we think, hopefully positive. And then we've got sleep. And those four things are all together. You can't really take one out of the equation. I know as we get older, it's harder to sleep. I've been having some like sleep issues myself um, at 50. This is the I've always been like a like put my head down, go to sleep, and a rocket could go off, and I would never wake up. And now I'm like awake, um, and I, I find myself sleeping really lightly, and that, that is really hard as we age. Um, I, I have tried melatonin. I tried it once or twice. It did nothing for me. So maybe some of you out there have tried melatonin. I don't know about Lunesta. I'm pretty sure that's prescription. So you kind of have to be careful with that. Here's the deal. Uh, working out that early in the morning is fantastic. Uh, you might need a rest, though, every so often. If, if there's a day where you go, I am so tired, or, or let's say you get started on your workout and you feel like it's kind of a mediocre workout, that's your body saying, you know what? Tomorrow should be a sleep day. 
Uh, and I'm here to tell you that that sleep is just as important um, as the workout. So I don't get up at every morning and work out at 5.30. That would be very hard to do. Um, I work out a couple mornings a week at 5.30, and then I work out a couple mornings a week at like 8 or 9. So you can kind of vary it um, and just see. And then, I mean, you know, with your work schedule or your kids, maybe you would just skip a day and then work out in the evening. But listen to your body. And if, if the telltale sign is if the next day your workout is just kind of mediocre and you can't seem to really get your groove on, it might be time for a little more sleep. Um, try, like, really making your environment very calm and try really deep breathing, maybe even meditation right before bed, because sometimes that helps people get into a deeper REM sleep. Great. All right. We've got Rhonda, and she's asking about engaging your core. What does that mean, and how will that help her with exercise in her daily life? Well, your core is the essence of everything. It's kind of the trunk of life, right? Your arms and your legs come off that core. And the core is three-dimensional. It's the front and the back of your body. So let's talk about that. When you engage your core, so that word engage or connect or contract, it's all about pulling in those muscles. So I want to I teach you a little something about abs. You guys, I am so sweaty. Like my legs are dripping in sweat. Thank goodness I put on shorts. Um, okay, so you have the vertical muscle right here. This is called your rectus abdominis. This is your crunching muscle right here. And you know that's that six pack up here. But most people, women, as they're aging, don't necessarily point up here. They point down here. So this right here that goes around your body is what we call our transverse abdominis. And this right here is like a belt. So I want you to think about cinching that belt like a notch or putting on a girdle or I guess nowadays we call them spanks and kind of sucking it in. That belt not only holds your belly in a little flatter, but it keeps your, uh, uh, your organs in and it also protects your low back because it wraps all the way around your body. And then you have your oblique muscles, which are your twisting muscles. If you think about your daily life, you use your obliques so much. I don't know what the percentage is, but you use your obliques more than you probably think you ever do because we, we involve a lot of movement in our transverse plane, moving around. Um, and then on your back side, you've got back extensors that all connect in there. So contracting that core and, and, and making that core strong helps you with balance, helps, you know, kind of um, keep your body, well, looking good, if that's one of your goals, but also keeps your organs in place. It keeps everything intact, um, and then it protects your back. So when you're exercising, and you, you might hear me on one of the videos at Get Health UTV saying, you know, pull your abs in, contract your abs, connect your core. It's kind of that mind-body connection where you pull in. I like to say, think about zipping a pair of jeans that just came out of the dryer, and they're a little tight, you go, you know, you kind of just pull in. So you inhale, and you pull in just slightly, exhale, really pull it in. So that um, core muscles are absolutely imperative as we age because as we age, our back, after all the wear and tear we've given it over the years, will start to take a toll. And if you can keep those ab muscles tight, it will protect the low back. Hopefully that helps you a little bit. Great. Larissa loves your workouts. And she has some questions, though. Um, she's post-baby and having some back spasm issues, she has 40 pounds to lose. So how can she start working out with these back spasm issues while they heal? That could be, um, you know, that could really be a problem postpartum. First of all, your body has just given birth to a baby, so congratulations. Um, second of all, you know, all the hormones in your body. You have that relaxing hormone when you're pregnant and it kind of loosens everything up. So as you're kind of getting your hormones back into uh, the proper, uh, you know, place and um, getting your body back into strengthening, I mean, that body changes, right, over pregnancies. Um, and so they, they might start to spasm because they're trying to protect your back. So a couple of things. Get a really good warm-up in for your workouts. I mean, do your cat-cow. Roll up and down. Um, do some rotation and twisting stuff and get that back um, warmed up. Then, if it starts to spasm while you're exercising, back off a little bit. You want to take baby steps. You've got to let it strengthen a little bit as you move along. So just take little baby steps with it. And then after your workout, do some recovery stuff. Uh, use a foam roller. I love using massage ball. And next Q&A, you guys, I'm going to have my props on the table behind me. I'm going to bring some of these things that I could actually show you live. I have these massage balls. They're a little harder than a tennis ball a little softer than a lacrosse ball. 
and I literally lay on the ground and I just put them in because right through my low back I get really tight muscles um, and so I'll just lay on that massage ball and try to get those knots out kind of like the idea of foam rolling we were talking about earlier but the foam roller is really hard on your back because um, it's hard to roll over those vertebrae it's not recommended and then it's such a big surface it doesn't get into those little areas so a little massage ball would help you with that too and that's what I suggest warm up do some recovery and then listen to your body great Stephanie's got a great question um, is one 30-minute workout as good as three 10-minute workouts throughout the day um, that's a trick question most of it is yes um, but it goes all into intensity uh, you could do three 10 minute intense exercises and our, our workouts and I do have a lot we have a lot of those on Get Healthy UTV we have a bunch of 10 minute um, workouts we have free ones and ones that are on the membership on Get Healthy U we have a bunch of 10 minute membership our workouts and um, if you're pushing yourself you're getting that heart rate up and you do that three times a day you're gonna burn as many calories and get the benefit internally um, as you would doing it all together also, and a lot of people do a 30-minute workout all at once, but their intensity is low. So it kind of goes back to intensity. Um, and so that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to walk and get my, you guys, every time we do this live Q&A, um, my computer starts losing its power really fast. I don't know why. I must know that I'm live. So I'm just grabbing my power cord, but keep asking questions, Kate. Okay, great. Um, what brand of cross-training shoes do you prefer the most for indoor workouts? Ooh, well, I'm kind of a Nike fan. If you've watched um, Get Healthy UTV videos, I wear a lot of Nike shoes. I love the way they feel. And here's the thing. I have a wide foot. So I think that Nike has a wide toe box. Some people say the opposite. But the trend in shoes, I apologize with all these cords. I have to keep them off the ground from my puppy. Um, the trend in shoes is the knit, that knit feeling instead of a big hard leather shoe. And so it expands and gives your toes a little space. So I'm really a big fan of what's going on with Nike right now. I tend to wear the Nike Lunar Glides. I like the Lunar Glides and I like the Air Zooms. That's what I've been wearing a lot of. Um, but I guess you have to see. And if you watched a Lunch and Learn a couple of weeks ago, and you can always rewatch them on Facebook, I talked about putting inserts in your shoes because the part of the shoe that the shoe companies pick up uh, spend the least amount of money on is the insert. They're usually just flimsy and icky. I pull them out and I just put literally Dr. Scholl's inserts. I buy them at Target but they have a nice arch support in there and it really helps your foot as you're doing a lot of squats and lunges and jumping up and down. Oh great. I love that one. Okay. okay. I'm going to plug in my computer. Um, Keep asking. I'm listening. Sure. Whitney knows that traditional crunches are no longer effective but how are froggy crunches like we do on GHU TV different? Um, okay, so that's a good question because crunches are effective. They are a good exercise. It's not that they're a bad exercise. They aren't the best exercise and they aren't the only exercise. So, you know, those people that you see at the gym that are, you know, they're just like freaking out to get their hundred crunches. Typically, they're not, they're using momentum. They're going too fast. And, you know, crunches aren't the only core exercise because the crunches really get the crunchy muscle, the rectus abdominis. So that's why we love a lot of variety um, in our workouts. Like on GHU TV, we do a lot of planking, side planks. We do a lot of Pilates exercises. We do um, a lot of different ab exercises to use our abs all three-dimensional. So it's not that crunches are horrible. It's just that most people do them improperly, and they aren't the holy grail. They aren't the best exercise. Now, froggy crunches, what I like about those is when you put the soles of the feet together and the knees apart, you kind of feel it down a little lower in the abs, and it changes where the focus is, um, and they're a little harder. So that's why I like them. So hopefully, um, you know, crunches aren't horrible. It's just that there are a lot of other variety um, of things that you should be doing. Great. Katie's recently lost 12 pounds, so way to go, Katie. That's great. But she still has some underarm flab, and it's not going away. Is there anything she can do about that extra flab? Well, all right. So she lost uh, 12 pounds. Katie, yes. congratulations. I think that I, I'm so happy for you guys who adapt these new healthy lifestyles. It's fantastic. Um, okay, so this stuff, the wiggle and jiggle, I got a little right there. I mean, it happens, right? Um, but here's what I want to tell you. You want to do bicep exercises, and you want to do tricep exercises using the back of the arm. Okay, so bicep and tricep. And you can tone and tighten. 
Um, and it should, a lot of times the, the elasticity in the skin will kind of help, uh, will kind of come back in a little bit. Um, and I really said it takes a little bit of time. It doesn't happen overnight. The biggest problem for people is that they'll be like, okay, I'm going to do triceps and biceps. And they do them for two weeks and they don't see any change. Well, you're not going to see a ton of change in two weeks. Um, but in two months, yeah, you'll see some change. In three months, yep. In four months to six months, yes. So the key to everything, you guys, if I could give you one little piece of magic sauce or one little tidbit of magic sauce, it's consistency. It's constantly doing a little bit all the time to change those muscles. So go for your tricep and bicep exercises and that should help you start to tone up. Great. Jody's asking if there's a specific meal plan suggested for menopause. Well, the meal plan I would suggest the puppy is over there eating something. Oh my gosh, she's crazy. Um, is real food. That is the meal plan I'm going to suggest, real food. As we get older, you've got to get rid of chemicals, food coloring. i got to tell you, food coloring is in absolutely everything, and there are alias names for food coloring. Just Google search it, uh, alias names for uh, chemicals and food coloring. You will not believe. Like, for instance, a lot of times it doesn't say yellow dye. It'll say E310 or something like that, and our eyes just glaze over the, yellow, the E310 because we don't know what it is but it's yellow dye. And um, you know, so you really have to be careful. Chemicals, preservatives, artificial flavors, artificial food coloring, all that stuff just wreaks havoc on our cells, on, the, on inflammation, on belly fat. So you really wanna avoid those things. And um, you gotta be a label reader. It takes a little bit of time. But if you literally eat fruits and veggies every day, healthy fats, um, healthy proteins, and that's your diet, I, I you know, People just lose weight and or um, they can't believe the, the way they feel. They feel so different. So try that. Drink lots and lots of water um, and avoid all those things. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of the app Fujicate. If any of you guys use Fujicate on your phone, um, and I can pull Fujicate up. It's F-O-O-D-U-C-A-T-E. It's a free app. And here's what I suggest you do, and I'm going to pull it up on my phone so you can see it here if I can get my phone open. Um, you can scan your food, and you scan the UPC code. And when you scan the UPC code, um, here's food decay. When you scan the UPC code, it gives you a, a, a rating for your food. So you might buy a bag of chips, you scan it, and it gets a D minus. And you're going to go, oh my, oh my gosh, why a D minus? It'll tell you why the D minus. It'll tell you what ingredients in there are the problem. And you'll become a more savvy shopper if you're scanning everything and going, hey, I'm looking for everything that's at least an A or a B. Uh, that's going to change the way you eat. But that's really the key to menopause is uh, get rid of all the fake stuff. Right. We have a nice question from Sally. She's on her fifth week of doing the definitions workout with you, and she loves them. She's seeing a huge difference in her body. Um, she's toning up and losing weight, but going with definitions, or should she try something new? Well, if she's toning up and losing weight, I mean, I think that's fantastic. And the one thing I love about the definitions programs um, for any of, or workouts for any of you guys who are GHU TV members or thinking about becoming one, the reason we did the uh, definitions workouts was because there's no jumping. So a lot of you said, I, I don't want all these plyometrics. You know, they're hard on my knees and my hips. So definitions is an intense workout uh, program, but it has no jumping. So... But if you're mastering that and you're feeling really good about it, I would definitely add variety. I think if you like, if you've mastered definitions, Power 20 is one of my favorites because they're really quick 20-minute workouts. One of my girlfriends told me, she goes, slow burn is my favorite workout. Um, so you might want to check those out. I also love Rock Your Body Boot Camp. Uh, that would add a lot of variety for you. So I would dabble in those two and see what you think about just changing up a couple workouts. And it's also important to keep your body always guessing and using in different directions. So um, I would try that. Great. On, kind of along those lines, I guess, Beth is asking approximately how many calories are burned during the HIIT workouts. All right. So again, calories burned is all individual. People ask me that all the time. And you know, I wish I had a magic wand. I don't honestly know exactly how many calories you personally are burning. A lot of it has to do with genetics, your heart rate, how hard you're trying, um, how much you weigh to begin with. So that's how much body weight, you know, you're moving in space. 
And um, that will create, like for instance, when my husband and I do the same workout, he always burns more calories, but he's got more mass to move, so he's going to burn more calories. Um, but here's the kind of the rule of thumb. If you're working hard, if you're getting that heart rate up and you feel like you're at a good intensity, 100 calories per 10 minutes is a fair amount of calories. And I'm always measuring, I usually like to wear my chest strap using my polar heart rate monitor. Uh, my Apple Watch, I, I'd say it's kind of accurate. Um, but 100 calories per 10 minutes. If somebody tells you that you are going to burn 600 calories in 30 minutes, believe me, I, I would like to know what workout you're doing and how high your heart rate is because that's near impossible. Um, unless, of course, you are um, you know, a pro athlete or perhaps you are at a certain weight where just to move your body in space, that happens. But it, it's not as easy as you know, those machines in the gym make you think you get on your, you know, I love it when people get on the treadmill and they're on there for 20 minutes and they're like, wow, I just burned a thousand calories. I'm always like, mm, I don't think you did. <laughs> so be proud of yourself for the work you do, you do. Try to go with about 100 calories per 10 minutes and then just remember that there's that afterburn. So because your heart rate is elevated and because your muscles are all like, you know, ripe, um, you get some good afterburn calories uh, also about an hour or two after your workout. Great. Sandy loves GHU TV. She can't, she can't wait to do more workouts. And she has kind of a fun question. She loves your workout tops. Where do you shop? <laughs> um, well, in videos, let's see. In videos, I wear a lot of, well, I wear Lululemon or um, Athletic. That's typically what I wear. Uh, you know, videos are weird, though, because you guys, when you're filming a video, it's just a whole different scenario than your real life because you don't want to tug on your shirt like you might in a class. Um, and you want to make sure that the microphone pack isn't falling out and all that kind of stuff. So I, I typically wear a Lululemon or Athleta. I've really been into the Athleta Chi Tank. Actually, tanks are very trend right right now. I don't know if you've noticed, like, at Target. Um, and even Athleta and Lululemon have changed. So they're a little bit looser. They're not so tight-fitting. But they kind of just fit nicely over a sports bra. And that's kind of been my favorite style lately. But, yeah, that's typically where I, I get my tops. Great. All right. Interesting question from Priscilla. Is it really possible for her to lose weight after doing one month of exercises with Get Healthy UTV? Oh my, is it possible to lose weight, you said? Is that what you said, Kate, to lose weight? Yes. Okay, it cut out. Of course. One month? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. When, yeah, when people say, am I going to lose weight in two days? Well, you know, maybe not, but a month? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, because, and it, of course it depends on what you've been doing prior to this, but typically if you're going to start exercising two, three, four, five days a week and you're going to pick up weights and you're going to do weight work and you are going to get that heart rate up and and you're going to eat healthy. I hope you guys are all downloading the um, clean, the healthy eating guide that you get when you join Get Healthy UTV. That's a great guide. It's like 40 pages of really good information. Um, then absolutely you can lose weight in a month. A month is actually a really good time. Most people ask me, can I lose weight in five days? Um, so a month is a, a very decent amount of time to be able to take off a couple pounds. Good answer. Okay. Um, we've got Rayanne, and she loves to walk. If she walks holding hand weights, like approximately five-pound hand weights, will that tone up her arms, or does she need to do actual exercises with those hand weights? She needs to do exercises with the hand weights. Why people walk with weights is for extra added resistance. So um, some people even wear a weighted vest. There are a lot of really cool weighted vests out there that will just add weight to your body. And then again, what I said earlier is the more mass you have to move in space, the more calories you're going to burn. And putting that weight around your core body makes it really well distributed. Um, I don't love to walk with weights because I typically have my cell phone or I have my dog leash or I have whatever, you know, so I don't like to have something in my hands. Now, if you walked with heavier weights and you were doing bicep curls, um, then you get some really good arm workout. And, you know, if you're doing this, if you're really moving your arms, you might get a little toning going on. But I definitely suggest some strengthening in addition to that. All right. Great. Let's do one more. We've got so many more. great questions coming in. We'll do one more from Janine. Janine's okay. trying to add more vegetables to her diet. Any suggestions on how she can get more veggies into each meal? Yes. Eat them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I love veggies. I eat raw veggies like every day, lunch and dinner. 
Um, I love raw veggies, but I cook them a lot. I mean, especially in the uh, wintertime, I cook them. I'll saute them in some coconut oil. I'll put some herbs and spices on them. I'll roast them, do stuff like that. But add them into salads. Add them into your smoothies. Throw an avocado, which is actually a healthy fat, but throw some frozen kale into your smoothies. Um, you know, get it into your salads. Mix it in with your eggs. Uh, put greens in with your, um, you know, if you're sauteing up some chicken, add some wilted greens or add some, I love roasting sweet potatoes and Brussels sprouts and uh, just anything you can do to throw some veggies in. We've got tons of great recipes online, so check some of them out. But make a goal to get at least veggies in two meals a day. Um, and, you know, that's, and if you get in three meals a day, bonus. But um, they're so good for you. So I, I know, Kate, you've done such a nice job of, keeping the questions um, uh, moving tonight. Thank you so much for helping me. Well, thank you for having me. Well, you are the best. All the ladies at GHU are the best. Um, all of you are the best. I just want to tell you all who are still watching at this point that from the bottom of my heart, I really do thank you. I appreciate your support. I love that you're a part of our community. I hope you learn. Um, I've always been an educator at heart. I love it. And I learn from people all the time. Um, never stop learning. That is the heart of life. Uh, so I really appreciate it. If you are not a Get Healthy UTV member yet, I am hoping that you are convinced to join. And we do have a special code for you. If you are not a member yet and you'd like to join, if you enter at checkout, the, the code Chris, my name, C-H-R-I-S 10, at checkout, it'll take the price down to $10 a year. Yep, I said that. $10 a year. That's 83 cents a month. So I hope I'm worth 83 cents a month to you to work out with you, okay? If you are a member, I love you guys. Um, I'm going to start polling you on Facebook. I want to know what workouts you guys want. We add new workouts every month. Uh, we have a metabolic reboot coming in June, and it's really awesome with Lindsay. Um, and we have, we're filming in June. I'd like to know more of what you guys want. So make sure you get to me either in an email or on Facebook and tell me what you want. Um, and I know we have to say goodnight. You guys are awesome. We will be coming back next month. We'll uh, broadcast and let you know what day it's going to be on once a month at 7 p.m., every Monday at noon on Facebook. Thank you, Kate, for being as lovely as you always are. Thank you to all of you for listening, and I hope that you will join us again real soon.